Okay, we'll jump right in. Uh, thanks, Kyle, and good afternoon, everyone. I guess the uh, the best news here is that uh, I am not the one standing between you and your lunch, so I can be a little more relaxed uh, with, with what I'm talking about today. Uh, for those that uh, are there that I've met before, it's good to talk with you again. And if uh, we haven't met, uh, I'm Jeremy Weiss. I'm a kind of newish uh, program manager with ASMET or the Arizona Meteorological Network. Uh, kind of newish in the sense that I've uh, been on the job for about a year and a half now. Uh, nonetheless, I think we got a lot, lot of good things going. Um, of course, traditionally, there, there have been a lot of resources, a lot of really great resources in terms of data that we can leverage. So I'm going to be talking uh, about that today. And I'm going to do so in a couple different ways, uh, just to make sure everybody's up to speed on what ASMAT is and what we do and what distinguishes us. Uh, I'm going to kind of set the table on some things like current resources and station reliability and data quality and access. So we're going to talk about the data that ASMET has collected for, in some cases, over 30, 40 years now. Um, we're going to talk about issues that uh, I think ASMET can be really proud of right now and that we're continuing to improve. I'll talk about those things, things related to quality assurance and quality control. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard those phrases before when it comes to data in this day and age. Once we have kind of the, the basics in place, I'll also uh, then switch to uh, some of the recent things we've been able to do um, in the sense that, yes, we are operational, uh, we being a team of two, I'll get to the other team member here in a minute, uh, keep things operational, but then at the same time, we are doing a lot of standardization with the network, a lot of modernization with the network. Uh, but, and then we're also going to be uh, developing some new resources. I'm going to kind of summarize some of those things for you as well, just to give you a really good idea on what ASMET is and uh, some of the things that ASMET will be. All right, so let's get started with, with where things are at right now in terms of resources. Uh, I mentioned that ASMET's been around for three, four decades. Uh, currently in the network, we have 28 stations. Some of those go back to 1987. Uh, our youngest ones, uh, not quite 10 years old yet. And these stations are stretching from the southeast corner, Cochise County, uh, stations in San Simone and Bowie, for example, all the way across the southern tier of the state into the Yuma area. Uh, we have stations basically all, and up, all up and down the western border of the state along the Colorado River from Yuma into the Parker area and up to the Mojave area. And then additionally, some stations in West Central Arizona between the Western border and the Phoenix area. And then we have a few stations even in the Phoenix area. Uh, in Maricopa County, where you all are at, uh, we've got, I think if my math is right, we have eight stations, three of which are in the metro area. Uh, those three are helping the city of Phoenix uh, with water use estimates on turf areas, such as in parks and golf state uh, golf courses there. But before I get uh, too far ahead on some of the application areas, uh, at each of these individual stations, the one near Gila Bend, there is a good picture of uh, what our stations look like. Uh, we're measuring air temperature, humidity, precipitation. Even though there's not a rain gauge in that picture, there is a rain gauge there. Uh, soil temperature at two different depths. We're measuring solar radiation as well as wind direction and wind speed. All of those are valuable variables uh, in and of themselves, but uh, from those we can of course derive some additional uh, value and such things as chill hours, dew point temperatures, evapotranspiration. I mentioned that turf water use uh, example just a moment ago. Uh, evaporate transpiration estimates uh, are a big part of that. Heat units, uh, as well as vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is part of the calculation for evapotranspiration. And it goes into uh, another product that I don't have listed here uh, that ASMET uh, historically has provided, and that being estimates of cotton heat stress uh, based on an estimate of the canopy temperature. 
So with all these data, uh, historically, we, there has been a real-time system. Uh, these observations are displayed online and updated every 15 minutes. Uh, we also are have, historically have stored hourly and daily values of all the measured and the derived or calculated variables that I mentioned on the previous slide. There have been uh, a variety of summaries, uh, daily, weekly, and monthly, uh, as well as different reports based on all these data. And where that has been online is uh, what we refer to in-house as the legacy website. Uh, I listed the URL there at the bottom of that lineup of bullet points there on the lower left of the slide. Uh, I'll be returning to why we're distinguishing it that way. Uh, it is the operational one now. If you were to go online and try to look for ASMED information, that's where you're going to find it. Uh, I'll be talking about a new website that, uh, with any luck, we'll be rolling out in the near future, uh, a little later on in the presentation. Getting to some of the issues uh, and topics that surround quality assurance. Um, I think one of the things you know that I've learned, just having been in the position for about a year and a half uh, and comparing and contrasting with other networks like ASMET in other states uh, is that um, we actually have one of the probably more, most robust uh, station maintenance and operation, uh, you know, activities, uh, you know, across at least the Western US, maybe even, you know, across the entire country. And that's really due to Scott White. Uh, he's my teammate here at ASMET. Uh, he is uh, basically without him, we wouldn't have asthma. Uh, he is a tremendous resource. He brings a couple decades of scientific field equipment experience uh, to the job. He's been with asthma uh, about three years now, if I'm not mistaken. And what he's done is really uh, gotten together for us uh, a really good, and like I mentioned, one of the best probably maintenance programs for this type of a network in, in the region, uh, again, even across the country. What he's doing every quarter is taking a mobile unit of sensors out to each of the stations and calibrating the sensors that are in the field. Uh, we are really, trying to keep on top of any issues that happen at the stations. And so quarterly sensor checks, quarterly sensor calibrations is one way to do that. Because truth be told, sensors do drift. Uh, this is not a case where you can set it and forget it. Um, you really have to stay on top of these things. Uh, in addition to those quarterly station visits, uh, Scott is visiting the stations for perhaps five additional times per year to basically do a clean and inspection. Uh, make sure that, you know, especially in some of the intensive agricultural areas along the Western border of the state, uh, the equipment is clean and is functioning properly. And the site itself is still, uh, you know, not overgrown with weeds, for example, or going to pose any other problems. And so we're finding out that this uh, program that he's developed uh, really has increased the reliability of the sensors uh, over the past couple, two, three years, relative to what uh, previous staff have told us was kind of the, the normal time span or lifespan of some of these things in the field. Scott also has a preventative sensor replacement program in place. For example, wind speed sensors are taken out of the field once per year. Uh, they are taken back to the lab taken apart, cleaned, put back together, recalibrated, and before they go back out into service, uh, he's bringing calibrated units out to replace those that he is bringing in. And he's also doing a fair number of equipment upgrades, standardizing everything, which is gonna make our maintenance and operations more efficient, uh, less costly, of course, too, as there is a lot of travel time with some of the more remote stations in the network. Uh, Example here this winter with some of the uh, particularly cloudy days that I'm sure you all noticed. Um, we, these are solar powered stations. There is a backup battery to cover us as well uh, during the nighttime hours. And what we were finding is at some of the stations with the, the solar panels of smaller capacity, 
uh, the battery charges were not getting high enough for us. And uh, fair to say, we're getting to dangerously low levels. Scott has been uh, making sure that the capacities of the solar panels now are higher, such that we can avoid uh, this issue in the future, as it wouldn't be good if we were to drop a station for a day or two and could not get data from it. That's uh, something we certainly want to avoid. In terms of data quality and access, uh, Scott and I are multiple times a week going over the data as it's coming in from the stations to the database, uh, looking for uh, you know, valid data. Uh, does this data, is it plausible? Does it make sense relative to other stations nearby? Uh, and that, of course, if there's an issue there, might be indicative of faulty sensors. Again, we really want to stay on top of this such that any issues that do come up are quickly taken care of. There's also automated evaluation of the data that are coming in. Uh, again, redundancy in this sense, I think, is a really good thing to have. Within the last couple of years, we've also put together a new system for everything related to the data from its collection, uh, from the stations into the database, processing therein, storage access, as well as backup. So that kind of wraps up uh, a lot of the data quality and assurance uh, topics and activities that we are doing. Really trying to make this a robust system as much as we can. So recent activities for uh, Scott and me at ASMET. Um, one thing that we've done, I think is a really nice thing, uh, is that we've increased the data collection from data to hourly. And by this, I'm not talking about the real-time system. That's still on the 15-minute time step. But this is the frequency at which we're bringing data from the stations into the database, processing them, uh, doing quality control and whatnot. One nice thing that this has allowed us to do is bring on the National Mesonet Program as a, an additional sponsor of the network. And that's gonna help us, again, not going back to what I said earlier, not only help us with operations, but that also was gonna help us in terms of costs with doing things that are going to improve ASMET, providing better services in the future, uh, both online and, and elsewhere. Something that Scott uh, did last year, for example, in the field is that uh, with the stations, the data are brought into the database by cellular network. He tried uh, to, and he did as best as possible, as things that the cellular network does that are out of our control are frankly out of our control. But what we can control, he's optimized. And he did that last year uh, at all the stations, uh, doing surveys of the cellular signals, the towers in the area of individual stations, and upgrading the antenna uh, uh, system, if you will, at the stations. The, the, the different, uh, he's got about, I think, four or five different um, variations uh, on this theme here uh, in order to, again, improve the communication such that you know, for example, with a real-time system, we want to make sure we're getting the data in every 15 minutes. Uh, sometimes with issues with the cellular network, it might be a half hour till we get data in. And so we're really trying to minimize any disruptions we have in pulling the data in uh, for people like you uh, than to use. And another thing we accomplished this fall and over the winter was just a simple improvement of our automated review of some of the incoming data. What I'd like to say there is that we are bringing in the best practices from the quote unquote industry uh, groups that uh, have put these best practices in place, such as the American Association for State Climatologists, uh, NOAA or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. These exist, um, not all of them, as you might imagine, are applicable to Arizona and our network. So we are taking those that are and putting them in place. Coming up this year, Scott, one of the things he's going to be working on in addition to maintaining everything and keeping the operations aspect going is starting a rain gauge exchange program. Um, these are going to be where we put out a newly calibrated rain gauge uh, out in the field at a given station, bring the existing one back into the lab, take it apart, clean it, put it back together, recalibrate it, um, and make sure that all the parts are in good shape. 
Uh, we really don't, even though it doesn't rain much, uh, as you well know, here in Arizona, uh, particularly in the southern part of the state, you know, we want to make sure that when it does, these rain gauges are going to be working properly. Some additional refinement to the automated review system. Uh, you know, quality control, as I've been reading in the best practices, is something that never ends. You only get better at it. We are going to continue to get better better at our data quality uh, and control um, activities. And then, as I mentioned earlier about the new, uh, or alluded to, uh, about the websites, uh, we are building a new desktop and mobile-friendly website. Um, a hint of what that's going to look like is right there on the right side of this slide. Uh, it's under construction, uh, very much in the build phase. So I'm hesitant. I'm putting out a URL at this point for you all to start kicking the tires on. Um, but what we're going to do uh, is, you know, a lot of the legacy material that is, you know, has been, you know, used historically, that's going to be coming over to the new website. Um, you know, the formatting might be different, but it's all going to be there and accessible. Uh, perhaps extra options when you're looking at data and tables, for example, where you can sort by station, you can sort by highest and lowest values for temperature, for example. So some additional functionality uh, to these materials. And you know, in addition to bringing over some of the legacy information products in the new format, uh, we're also going to be developing a lot of new online resources, I think. And that's been uh, pushing me to improve my software engineering skills, which is fine because it's been a, an interesting learning experience for me. Uh, but what we want to do uh, with some of these online resources, and I'll show a couple of examples here in a minute, um, is to have them very easily accessible online, very lightweight, very fast, very specific to the topic at hand. I'll show a couple examples, like I mentioned here in just a minute. At workshops like these in the past, uh, in mentioning the new website, uh, you know, people have asked for things such as email alerts. That is something that is going to be a bit longer term at this point, only because it's going to rely more on the real-time system, which we need to take from uh, you know, its legacy or current uh, system and way of operating and into uh, the new data system that we've put in place over the last couple of years. Uh, other tools that are going to come sooner uh, are new options to download data. Just make that process more efficient, easier uh, in with files that are in formats that you're looking for. Easier to process on your end. These are the things that we can do to make your uh, work with ASMET data. Um, if you are in the for example, in the research space, um, they use that uh, data at some of the agricultural centers. That whole process is going to become easier. And then showing a couple of examples of these um, data tools that we are going to be uh, putting together. Uh, some prototypes I've been working on this winter uh, include um, you know, this one on the right side of the page where evapotranspiration estimates that are calculated at the individual stations are then used to estimate water use for a specific crop. Here we've been working with uh, you know, the four stations in the Yuma area that ASMET currently has in the network and with some of the cool season crops. So a lot of the salad greens, for example. Um, this is, a, you know, it has been a legacy data product. Uh, we're and you know, with the new data system that we have, it's going to be able to afford us to be able to not in terms of price, but just in terms of capacity, put these uh, types of tools together where um, the user has a little more control on the specificity. Uh, you can see there on the left, one can select the crop, one can select the specific planting date by day as well as a specific harvest date by day. Uh, we don't have to rely on weekly or monthly summaries, for example, uh, for this information. Again, this largely is a result of the new data system that we have in place. And with some of the new technologies as well that are out in today's data world. Um, 
Another example uh, here of a lightweight tool that I've been working on this winter that looks at putting an accumulation of heat units in the context of different cotton growth stages. Um, what this example here shows is just kind of scratching the surface as far as what we wanna do in terms of incorporating the historical data from stations. I mentioned some of these stations go back to the late 1980s. Um, there is a lot of information there that we can leverage uh, to provide additional context to you know, current conditions in 2023, for example, as the example here on the right shows, um, as well as just more summary type information at a location, station averages of various um, you know, aspects of whether uh, that occur at that location. With that, I'll wrap up. I uh, hope you all have been enjoying your lunch. And, and um, thanks, for, thanks for your attention. Uh, while you have food in front of you, I know that can be tough to divert from that. Um, so I'll leave you with uh, my contact information. Uh, please feel free to reach out with any questions on anything I presented today or anything really related to ASMAT. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more about that. And I'd also be happy to take any questions right now if there are any. So thanks again. Any questions? Jeremy, can you put up the your second to last slide? Oh, there you go. Thanks. <clears throat> Just leave that up for a bit. Sure. Thank you. I have a question. Hi, Jeremy. This is Dia. So my Hi. question is, how, how much do you need to pay? Uh, I have met with farmers, they don't have a weather station. Oh, thank and you were asking about the cost for them to yeah. put a station there, how much it would cost them to maintain it. And, you know. So just roughly if you have a number. Yes, uh, with ASMET stations, there are a few pieces that do need to come to, into place. Um, cost being one of them. Recent quotes for us to put together a new station total $7,500. Uh, in addition to the station costs, uh, there is an annual maintenance and operation fee. Um, we've been able to this year, um, you know, with the additional support that we've been able to bring in, actually lower those annual maintenance and operation fees for the local cooperators. Um, and those, you know, it's a function of our travel time from Tucson, and those will range between one and two thousand dollars, roughly. Um, that's the cost side of it. the The other aspect of new stations uh, for ASMET, um, you know, we do need the local cooperator uh, who is going to be willing to put aside a really relatively small footprint. Um, some of you have seen these stations before. That is secure. That's a big um, So there's that aspect as well. Um, and another thing, and this relates back to the quality assurance topic, is that we really want to be careful with siting a station such that um, you know any buildings or trees, for example, are not too close by such that they affect wind speed measurements. Uh, we don't want any tall structures nearby, you know, that will shade the station. That's going to artificially affect the measurements of solar radiation, which, you know, for example, is an important part of the evapotranspiration calculation. So there's cost, and then there's kind of some of those logistics things, too, that, uh, again, this is something that I've been learning over the past uh, year and a half. Um, but I think that we're, we're, we're getting a good standardized system in place to um, be able to expand the network as, as the opportunities come about. Great, thank you. Any other questions for you? Oh, go ahead. Hey, Jeremy, it's Karen. We met last summer when, when we were looking at revising the system and you've come a long way and done some great, great improvements. So I'm looking at the cotton growth stages and heat units document you have up right now. And I'm assuming that that's an in the future thing, prototyping modernized versions of legacy products. So that's not available yet, is that right? In this case, Karen, um, and, and, and at least in part just for you, I made sure that this is actually available right now. 
Um, oh, yay. <laughs> so if, if you go to the legacy site, uh, there is you know a crops section, and in the crops section, there's the cotton subsection. Right, I'm at um, their cotton weather information. Yeah, the growth stages and heat units link that's at the top of the page is going to take you to this particular uh, data tool. Okay. And um, you know, I'll probably be making a few fine tunings to this uh, yet this spring. And we're going, I'm also working currently uh, on um, updating the heat stress data tool that you know, we had a really kind of rough early version of last year. Uh, so thanks for your patience with me on getting these up to a good operating level. Um, I'm going to be putting it in a much more efficient, fast loading uh, form, uh, much like we did here with the cotton growth stages and heat units. Uh, all the information is going to be there. We're just going to have it, you know, working faster um, and and just better overall. Uh, awesome. To use. Way to go! Thank you on, on behalf of me and like. 20 other PCAs that relied on this right here. I mean, it's so important to us when, we, when we're making our assessments of crop bigger and things like that. This is great. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. And any feedback on how to keep yes. things uh, you know, progressing and getting better, please let me know. Also, Jeremy, if you can share that with me so I can like, distribute it and send it out in the newsletter as well. That'd be great. Will do. Thanks. Well, thank you. Jeremy, I had a question on the, the water use one, the one that was a couple back. Water use in inches. Yes. So if you're selecting the, the crop, I'm wondering, depending on your, your application method, if you're on drip or flood or sprinkler, and I guess in general, what where are the estimated amount of inches per crop? Where where would where's that data coming from? So in terms of the evapotranspiration, uh, that is estimated directly from data at um, the particular azimuth station. Um, in terms of water use, what we're doing there, and this was something that you know I was working with this uh, with Dr. Jeff Silvertooth over the winter. And last fall, uh, he was pointing me towards some of the crop coefficients uh, that they use um, in order to take evapotranspiration estimates and turn them into water use estimates. And so you'll notice there in those two columns, the evapotranspiration is you know, roughly two uh, inches higher than what the actual water use of the crop is. And so, you know, there are, um, you know, references that we're using here. I have that, if you look in the fine print, paragraph three, the, the second hyperlink text there, the fao.org uh, website, that's the document that Jeff suggested I use in terms of crop coefficients, um, which are something that is also tuned uh, to the growth stage of the crop. So, you know, Early on in the crop's life, uh, you know, the crop coefficient might be one value. Once it's a mature crop, once it's closer to the end of its um, end of its stay, uh, you know, the crop coefficient might be a different value. And so those things, you know, I can recommend that um, you know, looking up at the looking up uh, you know the crop coefficient curve models for specific crops would be um, a much better way than, than listening to me try to articulate the whole process. Uh, again, something I'm learning about here on the job. Um, we do only have the cool season crops right now on this. It's uh, certainly something that as we revisit these individual applications and tools, uh, you know, putting in more crops. Um, obviously, we don't just grow lettuce in Arizona, we grow a lot more so having this information for the other crops as well, I think would be, be um, yeah, a no brainer in terms of what ASMET needs to do to, uh, yeah, to improve this kind of service. Yeah, because and, and based on that example, so the lettuce that's up there, I know that 
in the Yuma that's also up there, they'll have some 90 day lettuce, but then later on they'll have some some 60 day, sub 60 days. So I'm wondering what some people might get confused if they just see lettuce and going off the water use and seeing, well, I'm going to give my crop this much and it's going to depend on, like you pointed out, the, the season, which, which lettuce crop is it, which season is it in, and the variety of lettuce that they're growing. I think to address that question, which which is a good one, um, you know, I one would need to you know revisit these crop coefficient curves and see if they're specific to ninety day or sixty day lettuce, for example, or if there are different models out there, could we use them uh, and get that kind of level of specificity into into these models? Um, perhaps the the way to address that at least at this stage um you know might be you know if you're assuming the water use is similar between the two being able to specify the specific planting and harvest dates uh might be helpful in this case you know one could look at a 60-day window one could look at a 90-day window in retrospect and see what the different water use um you know values are between those two time windows but you know, to your point, Kyle, uh, the more we can bring in that level of specificity and granularity to these types of tools, I think while keeping them, you know, pretty simple interface wise, uh, you know, if it's just a question of adding 60 day lettuce and 90 day lettuce instead of just lettuce, then yeah, that's something that easily done. And, um, you know, doing those types of improvements, then, you know, the tool becomes more valuable, uh, more people can use it. So thanks for that question. Yeah, no, my mind's turning on it and wondering because I, I mean, it'd be as simple as having any and all grower just send you information. Here's the crop that I grew. Here's how much water I used, and that probably just becoming a mess real fast on your end. <laughs> so we'll try and figure out yeah, well, we'll, a scientific <laughs> way that we can validate some of these. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that may. Maybe the case where you know we'll have our station-based estimates and our crop coefficient model estimates, and then for those who want to compare, uh, you know, that comparison would be something that they'd be able to do then with this type of tool, um, knowing that you know they have their field numbers in their notebook right there. So again, these tools are really meant to to help inform, um, and you know, use in conjunction with all the other tools that folks uh, might be using uh, in the field. So yeah, the uh, sky's the limit as far as how we can develop these and where we can take some of the new new types of tools. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. You're welcome. Everyone have a great afternoon.